Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Leo lecture. My name is Molly Glevy, and I work in the Alumni Relations Office here at Hamlin. I'm so pleased to have lots of folks join us today for Generational Change in American, American Politics with Professor David Schultz. Uh, before I hand things over to David, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items, a little reminders. So you will be muted and your camera will be off for today's presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A icon in your Zoom dashboard on your screen. Um, we've got a lot of people with us today. I can't imagine we'll get to all of our quest all of your questions. Uh, we'd be happy to follow up later. If we don't get to yours, you can email us at alum at hamlin.edu. If you need any help troubleshooting or run into any technical issues, drop something into the chat. There's a few of us who are ready to help troubleshoot if you do run into issues. And I should mention, it is Friday of Homecoming and Alumni Week here at Hamlin. This is our last virtual event of the week. If you're able to um, join us, thank you. If you missed any of our virtual events, they will all live on our website. So you are welcome to uh, take in our Monday Leo lecture with Professor John Mazis, uh, Q&A with Athletic Director Verdugo. Um, uh, we had a networking panel yesterday. And for those of you who are not in St. Paul and might wanna get a glimpse of what campus looks like today, you go to our Facebook page, you can find a recording of uh, a Facebook live tour from yesterday. So I invite you to do that. And with that, I am excited to introduce you to Professor David Schultz. David Schultz is Distinguished University Professor of Political Science and Legal Studies. David has a BA and an MA in Political Science and Philosophy, a JD and LLM in Law, a PhD in, a political, in political science, and a master's degree in astronomy. A three-time Fulbright scholar who was taught extensively in Europe and Asia, and the winner of the Leslie A. Whittington National Award for Public Affairs Teaching, David is the author of more than 35 books and 200 articles on various aspects of American politics, election law, and the media and the politics. And he is regularly interviewed and quoted in the local, national, and international media on these subjects, including in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, The Economist, and NPR. His most recent books are Encyclopedia of Money in American Politics and Presidential Swing States. Prior to teaching, Professor Schultz also served as City Director of Code Enforcement, Zoning, and Planning in Binghamton, New York, and worked as a Housing and Economic Planner for a Community Action Agency. And with that, I welcome David Schultz to our real lecture. Great, thank you very much for today. And I just want to now um, share my screen. Just give me a second and hold on just a second. Here we go, great. And the talk is gonna to be today on generations in American politics. And I hope you find this as interesting um, as, as I have um, in terms of working on it over time. And so let me just also get this into the right mode there. Perfect, and let's get started here. Every generation wants a revolution. Every generation wants to change the world. The fact that some of you may know the reference for this slide and others such as my students don't speaks of course to the generational differences in our society. For those of you who know the reference, of course, it's what, it's the Beatles, um, it's the song Revolution. And for those of us like me who are baby boomers, uh, there are, are many icons for the baby boom generation. I, uh, the Beatles, of course, would be one. Um, I, I could also tell you that with many of my students, uh, you know, who are millennials and who are Gen Z, and we'll explain what all that means in a few minutes here, uh, my students are way beyond wanting to hear about um, where we were when the Beatles first appeared on Ed Sullivan, where we were when we heard when what JFK was assassinated, um, where we were when Neil Armstrong sat down on the moon, et cetera, et cetera, like that. But what I want to talk about today, the topic that I think is really quite interesting, is in terms of understanding how politics um, changes across generations, and with that, how with the passing of generations, let's say the 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 maturing and aging out of one generation and the replacing with another um, changes American politics. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about today about about sort of a little bit of the history, how we think about generations, what it is meant in terms of um, where politics is in America, 
But what I also want to leave you with today is sort of a thought, a thought about thinking down the line, maybe five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, or something like that, and asking the question, for example, when the students that I'm currently teaching at Hamlin, um, when they now have moved from ages 18 to 22 approximately, and they now become what, 40 years old or something like that, 38, 40 in their 40s, how will that generation, how will these students now, and for many of you, it might be your sons and daughters, how will they change the world and what will their imprint, what will their footprint, footprint, footprint be, pardon me, um, in terms of changing the world? And will they get what? Um, the, 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 the revolution um, that they want. Again, so the question we're thinking about here is if every generation wants a revolution, every generation wants to change the world, do generations get their revolution? Again, think back to Thomas Jefferson a long, long time ago, who might have been the first of what the revolutionaries um, who said that what we should have a new constitution every 20 years every new generation should have the right to remake the world in their hands and so that's what we're going to think a little bit about today now if any of you ever had a chance to sit in my class and i don't know how many of you today listening um are let's say former students of mine who've taken a class with me um i i teach among other classes, an introduction to American politics. And one of the things that I'm very much interested in teaching American politics, what are the drivers of political change? Um, the way I phrase it, um, are there some plate tectonics? You know, the reference to plate tectonics, you know, about the moving of our continents across the earth. Are there some kind of plate tectonics for political change, some big forces that really dictate um, how American politics operate. To what extent do larger global changes in the economy, um, how we produce things, well, perhaps moving from, let's say, an agrarian to a manufacturing to a post-industrial economy, do they, do they bring about political change? Um, how has the transformations of technologies from what, let's say, from coal to electricity to maybe solar, um, moving into what, a world where it's all about computers, or to what extent are global environmental issues changing the world? And so my students will hear me talk about these big drivers of change, and, and some students actually kind of laugh by the end of the semester and say to me, Professor Schultz, you act as if people don't matter. And I say, what do you mean? They say, well, you talk about these big structural changes, these things that seem to happen in long waves or that seem to be um, almost global in scope. And you almost seem to say that individuals um, don't have any political efficacy. I don't think I would go in that direction, but there's no question that I'm interested in these bigger, bigger changes that are going on. And that's going to include eventually thinking about generations where they fit in. Additionally, um, if again, you were to sit in one of my classes, uh, again, an introduction to American politics, on the very first day of class, I would write on the board six terms, race, class, gender, religion, region, and a question mark next to generations. And what I would say to you, what do I say to my students, is that if we think about the, the social cleavages, the points of conflict and, co and cohesion in American history over time, we've divided over these, at least these first five, that we all know about the unfortunate divisions that occur because of race or class or income, gender, um, religious differences in region. And traditionally, political scientists would study those. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at voting behavior. How do people of color versus white Caucasians vote? Or we might look at income and voting behavior or political engagement, how men and women might have different party affiliations or, or the role that religion has in terms of, of forming our political views. Or do people in the South versus the Northeast or the Midwest think about the world politically different? For the most part, political scientists have not thought much about a generational influence. And that's what we're gonna to try to focus in on today. To what extent do, do generations, and I'm gonna eventually define generations, to what a point do generations serve or changing of generations serve 
as a major political driver in our society. And on the, on the, the right-hand side here, we're going to talk at some point about intersectionality in politics. Because in my classes, I point out how we can't just view race or class or gender in isolation. That people aren't just male or female, aren't just black or white, um, aren't just um, uh, we are maybe female and white or female and a person of color. And, and so at some point, we're going to think about how these different variables come together uh, across generations in terms of telling us something about how our political system operates, um, why people believe what they do, um, perhaps how they act and again, you know, interact with one another. So, so this is what we're going to try to do today in terms of sketching this out here. Now, do generations matter? Let me tell you a little bit about how I got interested in this topic. Um, back in the early 90s, at the beginning of my teaching career, I was teaching in Texas. Um, and early on in my teaching career, uh, um, there was a person in the sociology department at the school that I was at, and he handed me this book, which was called Generations, A History of America's Future from 1584 to 2069 by Strauss and Howe. And he said, you have to read this. And I said, why? And he said, they offer a theory of America that basically says that every six generations rotate, um, that we kind of sort of repeat, repeat American history across six generations, and that you can explain or understand America by where we are in those stages. And I read the book and I was captivated, just absolutely captivated. Because among the things that I remember from reading generations was that the, the pilgrims, uh, the Puritans, who really were the first revolutionaries um, in American history, coming to America, you know, to, to found a new country, to found a new world, to basically affect a revolution um, compared to Europe. Six generations later, these were what? Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Six generations later, it was the abolitionists during the Civil War. Six generations later, it was the 1960s radicals. And I'm like, ooh, maybe there's something to Strauss and Howe's argument. So that's how I started thinking about it. But over the years, I've also thought about um, generations in other ways. Um, some of you, perhaps in business, have thought about this concept too, that, that people from different generations might have um, different interests in different products, um, that, that they might be using different things, they might be watching different television shows. Um, in marketing, I know an awful lot has been written about saying, well, what do we market to baby boomers versus what do we market to, um, let us say, millennials and so forth like that. I don't know how many of you have been at a workplace um, where in the workplace you've gone to some kind of HR event where they talk about working across generations, where the workplace has baby boomers or millennials, Gen Zs, Gen Xs. Um, and then, of course, there's kind of the, what I'm going to call it, the pop culture. There's always, of course, um, um, sort of the derogatory notions about what it means to be a baby boomer or a millennial or a Gen Z or fill in the blank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so across a lot of ranges, you know, we, we, this, this concept is out here about, about generations perhaps mattering. Uh, but again, as I mentioned to you, traditionally political scientists have not looked at generations uh, they've not put a big focus on it. They've looked at race, class, gender, region, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've kind of lit the other fields, um, sociology, for example, um, really think about the generational issues. So what I'm engaged in now, and I'll talk about this again by the time I conclude with my presentation today, um, what I started working on about three years ago was an edited book, um, an edited book of which I'm doing with a woman, she, she's back in New York, and we're doing sort of the first, what I'm gonna call it, the first major book in political science that really asks the question, do generations matter? You know, how do people across, and we'll eventually identify them, how do people across a variety of generations think about the world politically? And as there's a passing of a guard, as, and I'm gonna point out later, 
as we're now at the point where the baby boom generation is beginning to exit the political system to be replaced by subsequent generations, to what extent are the political values, the issues in our, in our system going to change? Now, I should also say, the other way I got involved or interested in this topic um, is I spend a lot of time over the last 20 years teaching abroad. Um, um, as you saw in my bio, um, I've been fortunate to be a three-time Fulbright scholar. Um, I've, I've taught um, um, in, as a Fulbright in Armenia, in, in Hungary, um, in Lithuania. I think I've taught in about 18 different countries. And, and many of them um, are, are post-Soviet, post-communist states. And what I noticed in so many of them is that the, the older people who, who grew up, who were socialized during the Soviet era, um, looked at the world very differently than the students that I had who grew up after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 or the breakup of the Soviet Union in, in 1991. Um, they, they, they dress differently, they speak differently, their worldview is different in so many ways. And, and what, I, what occurred to me is that the real shift in politics in places like Russia and all these countries occurs when all that generation that grew up during the Cold War, that grew up during the Soviet communist era, um, I'll nicely say exits from the political system and is replaced by a new generation of people with new thoughts. And so to me, traveling abroad, teaching extensively in Europe, I think about the issues of generational politics. Okay, now, I've heard this, this quote attributed to lots of different people, um, where what most of us want to think that what as we get older, uh, we become more conservative. Now, I've heard it attributed to George Bernard Shaw as well as a few others. The quote goes something along the lines of, if you're not a socialist at age 18, you, you, ha you have not a heart. If you are not a conservative at age 40, you have no brain. And the statement basically suggesting that why, as we get older, um, we become more conservative. We move from, from being quite liberal, maybe in college or just as a youth, and we shift over time as we become, let us say, business people or homeowners and so forth like that. And therefore, age, age is a factor that influences how we think about the world. And again, when I talk to my students, again, mostly at Hamlet, between 18 and 22, they're absolutely convinced. You know, they, they, they look at, um, I have a couple of older students, one who I think is 50 years old, and occasionally they roll their eyes, you know, when that person talks, kind of thinking, well, that's just an old guy talking or something like that. Um, um, but what this speaks to is a perspective that says that, well, listen, we, we train, change our views as we become more older or become older, I should say. And when, in fact, I'm going to give a different argument. Now, again, when I did my master's degree in political science, I did at Rutgers University in New Jersey many, many years ago. One of my teachers happened to be Roberta Siegel, who at the time, back in the early 80s, was probably the leading expert in the country, if not the world, on what's called political socialization, how we learn our values. And what she said made sense, of course, that, that we all learn our political values as we're growing up primarily from what? Our parents. Um, we, we learn them from them. But then something happens, and I'm going to get to the next slide, slide in a second here. Um, when we start to hit adolescence, um, um, we start to form our own sense of identity. Um, part of what adolescence is about is getting a sense of, 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 of a personal identity. Um, I shift away from my parents. Um, my peer group becomes important. Um, I start to form my own views. And if we were to talk to a variety of developmental uh, psychologists, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, for those of you who are psychology majors, uh, Jean Piaget, Piaget um, we know that adolescence is a critical period in terms of forming many of our views and many of our thoughts. And what these developmental psychologists will oftentimes argue 
is that the attitudes, the beliefs that we form in our adolescence oftentimes cement a worldview that stays with us the rest of our life. Yes, Roberta Siegel, my teacher, would tell me that, yes, we still continue learning. We can still continue to evolve. But in many ways, the attitudes, the beliefs, the worldview that we develop in our adolescence, I'm not sure if I want to call it microscope, telescope, or kaleidoscope, but it becomes a lens, a, a paradigm through which we view the world the rest of our life. And that essentially what I will point out is that while yes, many of us may go from being a socialist at 18 to a conservative at 40 or vice versa, the vast majority of us, our, our political views are fixed in our adolescence. Now, let's do some definitions here. What is a, def, a, a generation? For our purposes, a generation is a cohort of people approximately of the same age, born around the same time. Now, what becomes critical is how long do we think a generation is? Are we saying roughly the same time, one or two years apart, um, 10 years apart, 15 years apart? This, this is a matter of debate. Uh, and that's partly what we're trying to address um, in, in this book that I'm doing with Sally um, on generational politics. But for our purposes, let's just think of a group of people uh, roughly born within, you know, let's say a decade or so of one another. We may play with that a little bit, but that's going to be our time period here. Um, looking at that in terms of, of our definition. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, um, and let us sort of move on to my next screen here. Okay. And we want to think of of, of generational politics is forming in two stages. Now, there are some writers who say that just, just merely being born at the same time or approximately at the same time as others, that's enough to form a generation. Kind of just objectively be born close to others. We all have, this, we have a similar worldview. That's one school of thought. Um, Karl Mannheim, who is a famous um, German sociologist in the 1920s um, is really sort of one of the first to start to get us to think about generational issues. And he says, no, um, a generation um, um, really has a couple of aspects to it. That A, of course, it is um, people all roughly around the same age, which is kind of the objective component, but there's also a subjective component. Something happens that fuses an identity um, that we roughly at the same age um, experience some major event that, that helps form our political consciousness, that gives us a perspective upon the world. Strauss and Howe's book on generations makes that same argument. So what we're talking about here is what is a political generation? Let's think about a two-stage process. Stage one, we have a cohort of people in adolescence who collectively experience a major event fusing an identity for them as a group. Now, the issue is, what do we mean by adolescence? Now, when Carl Mannheim wrote in the 1920s, he was basically calling adolescence what? Somewhere between about 13 and 18, approximately. Many developmental psychologists would have agreed on that. But what adolescence now is a much more contested term. For many of you who might be older, who might be parents, um, for many of us, we realize that our children or perhaps grandchildren are much more politically aware or just aware of the world at a younger age than before. Um, that, that there may be people who are tweens, you know, maybe even a little bit younger, um, who, who might start to be um, considered to be adolescent. And then there are some developmental psychologists um, that seem to push adolescence into the mid-20s or something. The point being is that we've got a huge debate and huge concept here of what we mean by adolescence. It could start as early as, what, 10 um, and go as late as 25, or it could be the more traditional, roughly 13 to 18. Um, again, we're trying to address some of those issues in the book. But again, I'm not a developmental psychologist. Um, I can't resolve the debate. But stage one is this idea 
that a group of us roughly the same age in our adolescence experience some major event that helps fuse our, our political identity. We commonly experience something that we're like, wow. I mean, and it's kind of like, do you remember where you were when? Do you remember what? And we, we come to interpret it. We come to think about that event as forming or fusing our political identity. The picture that I have here is what? From the Great Depression. We're gonna find that people who, who are of, of an earlier generation, the experience of the Great Depression, uh, of the long food lines, of, of, of being out of work, of clearly fused or formed their political consciousness. So that would be one, okay. What is a generation? Stage two, 20 or so years later, as a previous generation exits, a new generation replaces them and remakes the world um, in our or their image. And so think about it. Stage one, we form a set of political views and a consciousness and identity in our teens. Now, most of us don't have a lot of political efficacy, a lot of political authority or power influence in our, in our, in our teens. But what happens over time Let's say we get to our late 30s and 40s. We've now risen in the ranks. Maybe we're a homeowner, a small business owner. Maybe we've run for the school board, city council. Maybe we've moved up in the political ranks. We're now at a point, me and the rest of the people in my generation, we are now what? An ascending, rising majority, replacing a generation or two that are ascending, exiting the political system. We are now in that point to act on our political beliefs at a point where we can now, <clears throat> excuse me, pardon me, um, imprint the political system with our, our worldview. We, so to speak, what? Have our political revolution at that point. And the way I described it here, perhaps those who came of, of, of consciousness during what? During the, the, um, um, the Great Depression wound up to be what? The leaders of the great society programs in the 1960s. The, the, the memories of, of being poor, the memories of the government helping out fused it. Um, I remember, maybe it's a small story here. My grandparents um, clearly grew up during the depression. They experienced the stock market crash, uh, but more importantly, the bank failure and lost what little savings they had. Um, my grandmother had a habit of, um, of, of, of taking spare cash putting it in envelopes and sticking it in books or cabinets, you know, for fear that what? Um, that if you put it all in the bank, it would be lost. And I remember when she passed away and we cleaned out her apartment, we literally had to rifle through every book there was, every nook and cranny um, so that we wouldn't lose envelopes. And we found dozens of envelopes, sometimes with only $10 in it, but, but that's, that was her. The memory stayed with her for the rest of her life. So think about political change as like the sands of time. Political change is the gradual and constant replacement of one governing generation another. It doesn't happen all at once. It's gradual like the sands of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a clock like this. Tick, 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 tick. As one, one exits, another one replaces them. Change is slow. Now I know Malcolm Gladwell, has talked about tipping points, that at some point enough sand, so to speak, has shifted that so does the political values. I think that's correct. But clearly at some point, the shift does occur. So let's meet the generations in American politics, the most recent ones. Uh, the greatest generation uh, is the name that Tom Brokaw gave um, quite, remember he was at NBC many years ago, to try to describe that generation that went off and fought World War II. So he called them the greatest generation. Some of us call them the World War II generation. Now, the dates that I'm giving you here are approximates. Um, um, there's some debate in terms of what the actual time periods are, but the greatest generation would have been those born between roughly 1900, 1924. The silent generation would have been, this, again, these are names that either pop culture or sociologists have given them. Um, we're born roughly 1925 to 1945. Um, 
quite standard definition for baby boomers, 1946 to 1960, although the Census Bureau says that you're a boomer if you were born um, between 1942 and 1964. Okay, um, I still go by a more classic um, definition here. Um, Gen X, 51 to 82. Millennials born 1983, 96. Gen Z born 97 to 214. And I love this term, the alphas, born 215 to whatever. Quickly on the alphas, about... Might even be yeah, but might be two, even two fourteen, two fifteen, somewhere in that area. Okay, um, about two years ago it was three years ago before the pandemic. Um, I got a call from Reuters News Service, you know, down in you know down in what Mendota Heights, Egan, and a reporter wanted to talk to me about the alphas, um, about this new generation coming up. And I said, sure, be happy to talk to you. So first he had explained to me who the alphas were, and then he turned to me and he said. Remember, it's about two years ago. He said, the alphas are just starting kindergarten about now. Can you tell me something about their political views? And I looked at him and I said, good gravy. They're just in kindergarten. I don't know. Why do you ask? And he said, well, businesses and marketers are already interested in the alphas to figure out what makes them tick, to figure out what they can sell to them um, um, now and then in the future. Anyhow, the alphas are out there. Maybe they're your children, your grandchildren, maybe your great-grandchildren. We don't know much about them yet, but I'll say a few things perhaps about them. So think about it. Each generation has its own defining experiences. And, I, and in no particular order, I, lay, I put these out here. So for example, for Gen Xers, um, this is perhaps what the 1980s, it is what, when manufacturing is closing in the United States, when we start to see some of the first major um, layoffs at the old, what, old Rust Belt industry, 70s and 80s, for example, um, whether it's, you know, whether it's what, the uh, General Motors or U.S. Steel, um, fiberglass industry, et cetera, et cetera. So for them, the consciousness um, of, of, of layoffs, other possibilities could be for them what? It could be the Reagan era. It could be Columbine. It could be um, the explosion that happened on my birthday, which is not the important point about it, of what? Um, of, the, um, um, of the space shuttle you know, that explodes on January 28th. How about for the silence? <clears throat> Among the things that might be formative for them, it's what? The McCarthy hearings, perhaps. If you were um, an earlier, earlier silent, might, be, might have been what? The Great Depression could have been World War II. For the baby boomers, you know, and I'm a baby boomer, you all know what we're referring to here. This is what? This is um, JFK. This is Dallas. Uh, this is 1963. Um, I can still to this day see that car and know now what's going to happen two or three seconds later, um, and it's not pretty. Um, or for Gen Z now, it's perhaps what? Gen Z. It is the, um, the Parkland shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And then how about for the millennials? It's the cell phone technology. Um, some have said it's what? The story of global warming. Maybe for the alphas, although they're young, it's the pandemic. All kinds of possibilities, but think about it. Each generation has those events or major events that fuse an identity. I should also point out that each generation has its own demographics. What we have here is a chart on the right hand, I'm sorry, left hand side that talks about the, um, the birth years and the peak populations for each of those generations. So at its peak, the greatest for what, 45 million. Um, the, for the silence, 55 million. Baby boomers, almost 79 million. Gen X, 64, 65. Millennials 79, Gen Z's um, over 90 million, anticipated that the alphas might be even larger, although we have indications that with the 2008 crash and now with the pandemic crash, um, couples were not having babies, um, that the birth rates are plummeting. So this could throw things off here. But just look at this, this the, the peak populations here. Um, and especially just for those of you who are Gen Xers, you kind of get squashed in between the big, loud, noisy baby boomers and, and perhaps the equally loud and noisy millennials. 
which is why for those of you who are Gen Xers, you kind of get forgotten that are out there because of um, the relative size of the populations. And I should also point out, if I had, had, if I had put it in here, that, that over time, these generations, if they're at their peak, but for the most part, they're largely also decreasing, at least some of them are decreasing in their population. The greatest generation now um, largely is exiting for the political system and it's almost non-existent now. I mean, I might say non-existent, there's a couple million left. The silence are starting to exit the system as are the baby boomers. The other thing to know, if I started with the silence and went to the Gen Zs, what has happened over time is something amazing. Um, the, the silence of the ones that I want to talk about here are the most white, Caucasian, Christian, and believers um, in God. Um, very traditional. And what's happened over time is that by the time we get to the millennials and Gen Z, they are now the most racially diverse, least Christian, and religious, with the highest concentration of immigrants of any generation or generations in American history. The, the generational demographics are dramatically shifting. The, the future of American politics in the next 10 to 20 years, the profile of America will be majority non-white. It will look nothing like it has looked like for the last 230 years. And one of the most fascinating things about American politics or America right now, we are the most rapidly secularizing country in the world that nearly 50% of, of millennials and Gen Zs either don't ascribe to Christianity or don't consider themselves to be, to be religious. And as I talk about in class, that growing secularization has enormous implications on politics, political attitudes, because oftentimes a lot of that is driven, that is political attitudes by our religious beliefs, especially critical issues such as what, abortion, LGBTQ issues, and so forth. So demographics, each generation has its own demographics, and each generation has its own politics. Silence, baby boomers, and Gen Z mostly describe themselves as conservative, according to Pew Research and other studies. Millennials and Gen Z see themselves as liberal or progressive. Now, this is not just, as we said, a consequence of age. It is, it is something more fundamental in terms of how it lays out here. So we're starting to see, as I'll mention in a minute here, a generational overlay with political attitudes, eventually with partisan attitudes in ways that, at least since we've been doing modern political science research, we have not seen. This is really fascinating. There's a variety of ways this plays out. Okay. In 2008, um, some of you might know that the Republican National Convention was, was in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I received a request from the U.S. State Department. Um, could I attend the Republican National Convention? They would give me press credentials so that I could talk to foreign journalists to explain you know, American politics, the Electoral College, the craziness about conventions, et cetera, et cetera. Most of us in America don't understand us foreign reporters don't either. And so they then asked me if I would represent the United States, um, and they sent me to the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, um, Estonia, as well as Finland. And among the things I had to talk about was to try to explain the difference between John McCain and Barack Obama politically. And so I thought, okay, there are several ways of doing it, and rarely do I use videos in class or videos and talks, but I did this for my presentations in Finland and those other three countries. And I said, for John McCain's generation, there were two videos that captivated that generation. One is, is UK Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's 1938 speech. He's returned from Munich negotiating with Hitler. Um, and at those negotiations, Great Britain concedes part of Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, um, to, to Germany. And Chamberlain comes back at the press conference waving this white piece of paper in his hand, and he says, we have peace for our time. A few months later, Germany rolls into world into Poland, World War II starts. The other, when I didn't put it in the slide here, 
is some of you have probably seen it also what? The sinking of the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor. For John McCain's generation, Chamberlain or Chamberlain's image here, the BBC newsreel, or, or the, the sinking of the USS Arizona was what? The world is a dangerous place. Don't trust dictators. Uh, that the lesson of, of World War II was what? U.S. Military, military might can save the world. John McCain ran in 2008 as what? A war hero, a prisoner of war, saying, I will keep you safe. Remember, this is post 9-11. For Barack Obama's generation, many of them Gen Z, many of them who are baby boomers, the famous scene is what? a helicopter over the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, as we lost the war in Vietnam, evacuating our, our, our supporters. For those of you who saw the scenes over Kabul or the U.S. Embassy um, in Afghanistan a couple of months ago, who are poor baby boomers like me, this, or Gen Zs, the same feelings went through our minds. But for Barack Obama's generation, this was a story of what? The world is not about bombing our friends in the submission. We have to try other things besides war. For John McCain, the lesson of the Vietnam War was why we didn't use enough military power. The images were powerful. John McCain, though, was speaking to a generation disappearing. Remember in 2000, he ran for president against George Bush, lost the nomination. Eight years later, he gets the nomination. But in those eight years, roughly 15 million people of his generation passed away. By the time he gets the nomination and runs for president, he's speaking to a generation that's exiting the political system, that's disappearing. Obama is speaking to a generation ascendant. That's one way of catching what I'm talking about here. As I mentioned to you, generations and parties overlap. I'm going to go maybe five more minutes max, um, and then I'm done and have plenty of time for questions and answers. We also know about partisan divides and generations. The silence and the younger baby boomers, baby boomers born after about roughly um, 1955 or so, are more likely to be Republicans. The older baby boomers, roughly, you know, either 42 to 55 or 46 to 55 um, are, are, are Democrats, as are the Gen Xers. <clears throat> now, of course, when I say this, I don't mean everybody. This is not like a law of physics, but a tendency. Tend, we know this for values. So we've got a generational, partisan, ideological overlay that we know that across generations, different generations, think differently about social issues, about immigration, about taxing, about spending of a whole bunch of different issues. But where are the millennials and Gen Z? Well, they tend to lean to the Democratic Party, but they're not fully engaged. Um, we know that millennials and Gen Z now, if we compare them to baby boomers when they were their age, you know, back in the 1990s, or back in the 1970s, pardon me, um, the political participation rates, voting rates for baby boomers and the 18 to 25, 18 to 30 was greater than it is now for, for the millennials and Gen Z. Um, the millennials and Gen Z, if I can use a baseball analogy, don't bat their weight or what a boxing analogy, I should say, don't, don't punch their weight, I guess to say. But what we have evidence is, is that the millennials and Gen Z view the two major parties like two different restaurants with two different menus. This is my metaphor, that they don't particularly like the menus for each. They want some things taken off each of the menus, some things put on, they want them rearranged. They look at the world differently. A much higher percentage of them view themselves as independents than we see from previous generations. And, the new gen and these new generations think about the world differently. Think about those of us who were brought up and socialized during the Cold War. Uh, socialism, communism were, were not good words. For, though, for the millennials and Gen Z, about, polls indicate about 45% have a favorable view of capitalism, about 45% have a favorable view of socialism. Why? The 2008 recession hurt them badly. The pandemic has hurt them badly. Um, um, they've seen their parents 
in a couple of economic crashes, lose homes, jobs, many things. Our students have enormous student loans and debts. They see apartments, houses costing a lot. They, they don't exactly see capitalism in the same way that, we, that many of us do. Additionally, um, they see the consequences now of global warming hitting them in ways that previous generation didn't. Parkland shooting um, um, became, and I did a piece in the Hill about this about two years ago, became maybe the coming out call for Gen Z. And of course, the Obama and Trump presidencies um, fused their consciousness. Now, where all this is going, famous book, and I really wish I wrote this. It's, it's an amazing book. Walter Dean Burnham, 40 years ago, did a book called Critical Elections in Mainstreams of American Politics. And he said that every 30 to 40 years, we have critical elections and realignments that refine political parties and political agenda. Um, that it's driven by economic, political, technological, and he didn't say it, but I'm gonna say generational change. That, that parties reorient it, they form new coalitions, they form new political ideologies. We are perhaps starting with the election of Barack Obama in 08 in the middle of a new critical realignment that's gonna reshape the Democratic and Republican parties. A generational shift in political loyalty. Will the Democratic and Republican parties survive at all? Or do they take on a new name? Remember, over time, what the Republican Party has stood for, from the party of Lincoln to the party of Teddy Roosevelt, to the party of Barry Goldwater, to Ronald Reagan, to Donald Trump has changed. The same thing with the Democratic Party. Will in a decade, the two parties look different? Are they merely shells of which we fill in something? Who knows? And then with that, we should think about some other things. Where are college-educated suburban women? A generation ago, they voted Republican. Now they moved independent and now they're getting closer to the Democratic Party. They're becoming the new center of, of, of American politics. Everything revolves around what, what college educated suburban women do. For those of you who are female and alums from Hamlin, that's, that's who I'm talking about here. Are, is this a generational shift that's going on? The answer is yes. And then think about 2020 the beginning of the end of the baby boomer era of American politics. Um, for the last 30 years, baby boomers were the largest generational voting bloc in American history. In 2020, millennials and Gen Z were 37% of the electorate. They have surpassed the baby boomers. Our two, two baby boomer presidents, Bill Clinton and George Bush, we are now ready to see this transition in American politics. Um, and what it's going to look like is going to be fascinating. And this a couple of last things here. <clears throat> Think about some ironies. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was the choice of baby boomers and female Democrats born before 1974. Bernie Sanders was the choice of millennials. Kind of interesting to think about here. And now my, that's about the closing. What about the future of American politics? Changing parties and composition, changing party composition or changing parties? Will we see new issues such as guns and global warming emerge? Are some issues such as recreational use of marijuana, LGBTQ issues, immigration, um, the politics of rich and poor, um, are these gonna be new issues? And will the future be what? Belong to AOC. Some of this we're gonna talk about in my book. Generations in American Politics. It comes out next year. Sally Friedman and I are presenting it at the University of Michigan Press. Questions and thank you. And I hope you enjoyed today. And I know I left you with a lot. And I should say quiz comes at the end of, end of the talk. So how do we want to do this? Um, Molly, how do you want to do you want me to, do you want me to um, throw some questions your way? Yeah, please do so. Okay, I'll do it that way. So there's two questions that are related that I'm going to start with. One says, please comment about the current gridlock in the Democratic Party in Congress and how generational differences may explain why this is happening. And then the question um, that's related to that, hang on, I got to scroll up a bit to read it, says, I don't entirely buy that baby boomers are leaving the political system. Most of Congress right now, certainly the committee chairs and powerful insider figures are baby boomers. And it doesn't feel like they're leaving anytime soon. With Republican gerrymandering set to give them a political advantage, how does this figure into the 
your model. Okay, Sir, good. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. These are great questions. So let me start by saying that that I think 2020, I'm saying, is the beginning of the end of the baby boom era of American politics. It's just starting because, like I said, is that up until, let's say, in 2016, baby boomers were still the largest generational voting block in elections and the largest in American history in terms of numbers. And, and with 2020, we're starting to see that shift. And so it's not over yet, much to, much to the dismay of my 18 and 19-year-old students at Hamlin who are kind of like, listen, boomers, um, get out, move away or something like that. It's not happening yet. But the, but the shift is starting to begin to occur. And over the next five to 10 to 15 years, we just have to be honest, you know, age demographics are going to kick in. You know, my nice way of saying it is what? Generations are exiting. The not so nice way of saying is what? People are dying off. In the same way that McCain's generation exited, uh, we're going to see the same thing. So, so you're right. We're still we're still not at that point yet. Now, the the gridlock is exactly it, within the. We got two different gridlocks going on here. In part, there is a generational gridlock between the Republican and the Democratic parties, where it is um, some of the younger baby boomers in silence who are the main generational blocks of the Republican Party squaring off against baby um, older baby boomers and and um, um, gen, gen Xers and and in some cases you know some of the even younger millennials and so forth so on one level democratic versus Republican politics is partly generational certainly not all of it um, but within the Democratic Party um, you're exactly seeing that. Um, you're seeing that um, the baby boomers um, are, are, are more the centrists. You know, the Joe Bidens of the world, um, the Nancy Pelosi's of the world are more centrist, maybe even the Chuck Schumer's of the world, depending on your perspective here, versus what? The Ilhan Omar's, AOC's, and so forth like that. So certainly not saying it's across the board, um, because if I had more time, I would talk about how generations interact with what race, class, gender, and so forth. One of the things that we have found so fascinating, remember there was a story that what millennials were supposed to be what the post-racial generation when Obama got elected? Um, well, they're not. Um, I mean, um, and, but one of the things that we're finding really fascinating, and I think this hits a little bit at, uh, uh, at Don Erlinson's comment here, um, is that what we're finding in our research in our book here is that there are pretty significant breaks with the millennials compared to previous generations, except with, with white male millennials who think about the world politically almost like the same as their grandparents do, like their grandfather. Um, so, so that is really interesting um, in terms of those parallels. So we have to take everything that I'm talking about here and subdivide this by saying, okay, would an African-American millennial view the world necessarily the same or interpret the world same as, let's say, an Asian or a white? No, we've got some differences out there. So an exceedingly good, good comment here. OK, um, if I can actually look at it here, I've got what um, I'm, uh, 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 I'm Camilla. I'm wondering about your reference to millennials and Gen Z experience, the highest concentrations of immigrants, any generous question. Is it only from 1900 onward? What about the 1800s when there were so many European immigration happened? How's it compared to them? Um, well, we're, what we're looking at, at, believe it or not, um, is that what we're seeing right now rivals uh, rivals what we saw in the 19th century. Um, the um, I think you're right. It may have been for like, let's say, my great-grandparents' generation, which came through Alice Island. And I don't know how many of your parents came through places like that. I mean, we did have, you know, at that point, it was the Europeans. It was the German. It was the Irish. It was the, again, the Europeans. Um, but we're looking at numbers now that are the greatest they've been, at least since 1900. And some demographers are arguing um, the highest level ever. And the reason why I say that, we don't have the best of records going back into the 19th century, um, either from census records or so forth, to really um, uh, to really sort of give us a, a firm fix in the way we have now. So let's see, what do we have here? Okay, so this is John. What will happen with the infusion of non-European immigrants in terms of generations and generational change? Well, that's the interesting question here, is that think about two dimensions here. What are we gonna look like in the next 10 to 15 years when, when we have this 
as I talked about this rapid secularization that's occurring, you know, to what extent um, is that going to change, you know, where we, we just don't have the same concentration of Christian and religious that we used to. And the same thing here. Um, part of what I pose to my students and say, think about this demographic shift. Okay, now Democrats foolishly argued for years, demographics are destiny, that the demographic shifts are automatically going to play in their direction. Well, I always say demographics are possible. Demographics are not destiny. Demographics are possibilities. Demographics bring potential changes. And to what extent will the demographic changes change the United States politically, sociologically, versus to what extent will they be social socialized and it changes them? The answer is a little bit of both that's kicking in here. Okay, um, does the growing attention brought to police brutality over the last 20 years have an effect on Gen Z's generational political values? And again, you follow up, um, does the distrust of political system uh, see a new generation cause concern? Um, there is no question that, that George Floyd, and I probably should have thrown this in here, um, George Floyd is going to be a marker for a generation. Uh, that, that again, as I'm talking to my students at Hamlin right now, mostly 18 to 22, um, George Floyd, you know, the nine minute, 29 second tape, and we all know what we're referring to here, is fused in their brain now. And I wonder what this means um, down the line. And I would love to see better polling data in Minneapolis on the police reform legislation or nationwide in terms of to what extent our calls for, let's say, defunding the police or reforming the police driven by generational perception also. I suspect probably a lot. Okay, let's see. I think Rita is, is and I'm not sure if that's giving me the hook or what here at this point, uh, or, or somebody else's. Okay, so we have, let's see, if I can work down here. Um, because I think we have time for a few more here. Uh, again, thank you. Let's turn off the screen. One of the biggest I've seen now is a clear division in our country. Um, it seems like it's always us versus them mentality in areas of politics. Has it always been this way? You know, it's really interesting. This morning in my American politics class, um, um, there's a book that I have my students read. It's a very little thin book by a historian, Daniel Critchlow. And it's called A Short History of American, po a short, what, a short, I think it's called A Short Introduction to American Political History. And I have them read this because so many talks that I give, people say to me, we've never been this polarized, divided in America. And the chapter I had him read on Critchlow today said, guess what? There is this thing called the Civil War in which we were far more polarized back then. And, that, and even in the 1960s, remember, um, for those of us who were there, um, the polarization was so severe that what? A US president, his brother, and a civil rights leader were all assassinated. We were hugely divided um, by, by a war, in, an unpopular war in Vietnam. And so one of Critchlow's messages and one of the messages that I give to my students is that we have all, always faced major crises in terms of division. And part of what I see down the line, and we talk about this in the book, is that the partisan divide in this country on the divide that we see largely ends in about 10 to 10 to 12 years that the, the, the divisions driven by religion, by generational differences are going to form a new political center. Thus, my reference, at least for now, that the new political center in America, college educated suburban women, um, the future belongs to, let's say, Molly um, or people like Molly at this point who really become what? who really sort of define, you know, where American politics, at least for the next decade is. Um, but longer term, we're going to see a new center. I mean, how many of us here think in 10 years, we're going to seriously fight for good or for bad over LGBTQ issues or, or recreational use of marijuana? Um, 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 largely, those issues disappear from the political scene in terms of issues we fight over. Let's see. Are there any other questions? David, I think you should answer the question. That's what's the title of the book coming out next year? Okay, so the title of it is, is called, uh, if we want, if, if, if I could go back on my screen there, if I can sh show it again. Oh, sorry, I bumped you up. Okay, it's, you know, it's okay. It's okay. If I can go back up. 
Okay, it's going to be called Generations in American Politics. Uh, it's um, Sally Friedman and David Schultz were the editors. It's an edited sort of book with a whole bunch of different perspectives on it. Uh, University of Michigan Press probably will come out late spring, early summer. We were timing it so it would come out in time for the 2022 um, midterm elections. Um, and um, that, that's the title for now. I have no idea what the cover is going to look like. I just pulled that picture up for now for the heck of it. I can include that in a follow-up email to folks too. Um, sure, sure. Be happy to yeah. do so. And yeah. of course, we shouldn't forget the fact, you know, I think you're going to mention this also. If we didn't get to your question um, or if you want to do a follow-up, um, I suspect your office would be happy mm -hmm. um, to put them in contact Absolutely. with me. And of course, people can always email me directly if they feel comfortable about doing that too. Thank you, David. Yes, if, if anybody wants to, um, alum at hamlin.edu, and we'd be happy to uh, we'd happy to share those questions with David. And if you don't, if you want to go the easy route, that's certainly possible to do. I think we. Thank you, David. Thank you again. This no is, problem. Uh, I think an annual part tradition, part of our homecoming and alumni week, to have Professor Schultz speak, speak to a group of alums. So I really appreciate your time and preparation, and I appreciate everyone who was. Um, with us today. This will be uh, recorded and put up on our website. So if you want to go back or if you had to step out at some point, or if you want to share it with friends, it'll be at hamlin.edu backslash Leo lectures, probably Monday, I would say it would be. Um, we also have another Leo lecture next Thursday, October 7th, uh, which is called Curiosity and Creativity, Lessons from Marketing Innovators. It's uh, two alums, Michael Abada and Jeff Freeland Nelson. Uh, speaking with Sonal Gurton from our School of Business about how to use lessons from marketing and innovation in your own career and sort of future thinking. So take a look on our website for information about that. And I think that's everything. Thank you, David. Thank you very much and hope to see you folks um, next year. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Now.